you be Steve from that old Yorkshire geek? And it's Christmas, so I've got my Christmas Santa and my Christmas tree look. So, and my Christmas intro. So there we go. Let me adjust myself. So welcome to the show. Welcome to my midweek news roundup. I've uh, got a few news stories and a trailer to watch, first of all. But uh, straight away, we've got Wind Grace and Josh Temples here. Never fear, Maddie is here, harpoon at the ready. <laughs> That's a new catchphrase, isn't it? It's always good to have a car, uh, I was a carpoon, have a harpoon at the ready. Anyway, uh, before we start, don't forget, like and subscribe. Where are we? Like and subscribe, share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you subscribed already. Uh, right, we should be live on YouTube. I haven't had a chance to check. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we're live on Rumble, fingers crossed. Hit the refresh button, and yes, we're live on Rumble, and we should be live on Twitch. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Right. So, uh, off we go. Um, right, first story. It's not really a story. It's a trailer reaction. It's the trailer for the official trailer three for Dune Part 2, which I've not seen yet. So, I quite like the first film. I'm a big fan of the uh, 84 Dune. Uh, I know it's bonkers and mental, and so the effects are a bit iffy in places, but I love that film. It's balmy. But um, um, hang on, what's Wingrace saying? Bring back Patreon. No heck. <laughs> It'll be my Patreon. We might do one day. Maybe one day. I was finding it a bit too much to be doing stuff for Patreon and for YouTube as well. Maybe I should cut down on YouTube stuff and do more Patreon. I don't know, but. Um, I was struggling. It was getting a bit too much. Um, anyway, so what we're talking... Um, June part two. Uh, we're going to watch the trailer for that. And um, uh, what we're saying... Um, and Windgrace says about it, because I was mentioning in the chat before we started, uh, saying that the, the podcast guys, Brian and Shane, uh, they've just done a, a live stream a couple of hours ago. And they were talking about it, but I didn't see that part of it. Uh, I, I came on, I started watching it, but I, I, it was like close to the end. I was I'd been busy. I was busy drawing for my son and stuff like that. So I missed that part. So Wingrace is saying, Brian hates it. Shane thinks it looks good enough. And uh, 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 Robert Mybernet lost his mind, which I'm not surprised. <laughs> which I'm not surprised. Uh, Just Temple uh, doesn't like Robert Mybernet, but never mind. Uh, never mind. Um, I like Robert, Robert Marbonet, but, um, you know, sometimes he gets a bit overexcited, doesn't he? <laughs> I mean, he loved Godzilla, King of the Monsters, which I thought was bloody awful. But um, anyway, he's a Hollywood chap. He's a Hollywood chap. Right. Uh, oh, and Josh says about this uh, this trailer. Before we watch it, uh, I watched it. Makes me feel uncomfortable. Feel it's going to go in the wrong direction. All oh, right. Right, well, we're going to watch it now. So, buckle up for the trailer. Uh, right, so I'll make myself titchy tiny. I've met myself titchy tiny, and uh, there we go. Right, are you ready? Here we go. I'll mute myself, and uh, we'll just watch it, and then we'll talk about it. I might love it, I might hate it, we'll see. Right, off we go. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. It's been a while since you've had one of those nightmares. Tell me, what was it about? It's only fragments. Nothing's clear. You've been fighting the Harkonnens for decades. Oh. My family's been fighting them for centuries. Your blood comes from dukes and great houses. Here, we're equal. What we do, we do for the benefit of all. Well, I'd very much like to be equal to you. Maybe I'll show you the way. Deal with this prophet. Send assassins. Fade, Rafa. He's psychotic. Yes, 
50 possible futures all at once. And in so many futures, our enemies prevail. But I do see a way. There is a narrow way through. is to you. Do you believe me? This is a form of power that our world has not yet seen. The ultimate power. I want you to know I will love you as long as I breathe. You will never lose me as long as you stay who you are. Consider what you're about to do, you call a trade Silence! Yeah, uh, what's that bit at the beginning? Don't let me go. Uh, that looks all right to me. It's technically, uh, well, not technically, it is. It's, it's a love story with the backdrop of a you know galactic war sort of thing, isn't it? Uh, but set on one planet. Um, but yeah, I, I think it looks okay. Um, this is his dream, isn't it? I presume, or is this the um, what's happening here? Is that? Um, I forgot to call it now. Um, Arakeen. Is that Arakeen? What's this above it? Is that some sort of ship or something? I don't know. But that's reflecting whatever. I don't know. But is this the where the nuke the shield wall? Is that that? I don't know. Is that what he's watching? Or is he just having a dream? I don't know. I don't know. But it looks okay to me. Let's go through it anyway, a bit at a time. But uh, anyway, as we see, it is a love story between Paul... And uh, oh, I forgot about the name now. Chen, Chen, I forgot the name now. Never mind. Uh, uh, Zendaya, um, which I suppose is is what it's about. But they keep going about being equals and stuff. You know, he, he's the born into a royal family essentially. Um, he's he is the duke, isn't he? The duke of um, Caladan, um, born into royalty. And the great houses of the uh, galactic, I don't know, what's it, what's it, is it an empire or what? I don't know. It's got an emperor, so I presume it's an empire. Um, and she's saying, we're all equal. And then he's going on about all that uh, in a bit. Hang on, let's get to it. Oh, there's the, uh, hang on, I've gone past it. Let we see a thumper, using a thumper to draw out a, um, I still missed it, look. Where is it? We saw the blue water, didn't we? The water of life. Uh, are these the uh, the Fremen is training? I bet they don't use the um, um, what they call it, the weirding modules because I think that were. I've read the book. I've read Dune many years ago when I was younger, but I can't really remember a lot about it, and I can't remember if the weirding modules were in the book. Uh, I'm sure I've, somebody said that they weren't, but I can't remember. It's that long since I've read it. Uh, they were just done for the the David Lynch film, where the, his his name Muadib became a killing word, didn't it? Um, uh, oh, hang on, people are talking to me. Uh, Josh Temple says he's not their equal, but their savior. Well, essentially, he becomes the Messiah, doesn't he? Because is it the second book? Is June Messiah, and he essentially becomes the spoilers. Um, the, the the ruler of the galaxy or the known universe or whatever, doesn't he? And he's kind of a, a brutal ruler. Um, and what he does essentially just destroys the, the empire, doesn't it, sort of? Because he, he makes Arrakis fertile again, doesn't he, at the end? Um, but anyway, uh, just killing the sandworms and stuff. Just no more spice, no more space, uh, interstellar travel. Uh, what else? Uh, as long as it isn't a hegemony, uh, or hegemony, I did to pronounce that word. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, don't want any gone in this. Uh, I like the smaller thumpers in this. Um, 
I couldn't tell how big it was, to be honest. Last I'm an 84 fan. I'm a David Lynch Dune fan. Anyway, so yeah, these are the Fremen training, probably. And uh, hang on, see if I could do a, a skip if it'll let me. It's not good, is it? Because it's. Um, who's this? Who's that? I don't know who this is. Um, anyway, she's got some sort of thing she's reading. Is she um, one of the, the sisters, uh, the uh, uh, Bene Gesserit? I've no idea. I've no idea who she is. Um, I've been fighting the... They call them Harkonnens in this, don't they? Uh, how was it? Harkonnens. That's how I, how I always pronounced it. But they come back. Come Harkonnens in this. Um, there you go. You, your blood comes from dukes and great houses. Here we're equal. I think some are more equal than others, aren't they? <laughs> But anyway, uh, I've just got the blue eyes from the spice. All right, Fade Rowther. I didn't like this, this fella. He's no Sting, is he? Uh, sting from the police, not Sting from the wrestling. <laughs> uh, there we go. There he is. It's... He just looks like a surly ball. He looks like... Um... One of the war boys from Mad Max, doesn't he, Fury Road? It doesn't look like, um, and it, not to me anyway, it, it doesn't look particularly uh, intimidating. But anyway, uh, these are the Sardaka, or is it Sardaka or whatever, I don't know how you pronounce it, you know what I'm like, I think. Um, and again, these, I didn't think these looked very intimidating. When we saw them in the first film, we saw them like getting ready, didn't we? So I presume these are, the, these are there. Um, that like they're the emperor's soldiers, aren't they? Uh, Prometheus is a bit too, um, um, bit too what? <laughs> I've, I've, I must have said something, <laughs> I've forgotten what I've said already. You know what I'm like, I told you I'm an idiot. Uh, there's a big sandworm. Uh, is it, is it a sarlacc? I know this came first. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so they're running for their lives. And that is Fade Rowther, played by Sting in the Dune, uh, the Dune one, the David Lynch one. Uh, I don't know who this is. Who's playing him in this? I've no idea. But it doesn't look scary. Maybe he's terrifying in the film. I don't know. But it doesn't look terrifying to me. Um, are these the Benny, Benny Gesserit witches? Or are they the... the the, the sisterhood of sisters, the Bene Gesserit who were a part of the Fremen. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, so anyway, all this blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they're, they're all getting ready now, going to war. It's, it looks cool. cool. Sorry, let me mute it. Looks cool. With, um, cool effects and all that. Charney, that's a name. Um... But she's in the middle of the fight, obviously. But so was um, Sean Young in, in the 84 version. And there we go, that's it. That's it. Uh, we've got a glimpse also of um, the other one, uh, Raban. Um, Fade Raban, is it? Um, um, the wrestling fella um, who plays him. I forgot to put name now. Dave Batista. We've got a glimpse of him as well. Oh, some cool explosions, stuff blowing up. Uh, there was, uh, there he is, that's, um, uh, oh, God, me and names. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the, not French, is he French? Where is he from? I can't remember. Spanish, Spanish fella, isn't he? Him. But anyway, yeah, it looks fine. March 1st, anyway, it's coming out. But obviously I won't be able to go see it because my son won't go see it with me, so I'll not be able to go see it at the cinema. I'll have to wait. I asked him, do you want to go see Godzilla Minus One on Friday? No, so I'm going to have to wait. But um, anyway, so there's some sort of arena going up. Why is it in black and white? Is that deliberate? Uh, or they just, are they hiding something? Is there just a lot of colour, a lot of blood maybe? I bet there is. I bet there's blood. So they've made it black and white. So they can't see the blood. Who are these? <laughs> Who are these in the background? Some sort of um, um, dance troupe or something, you know, doing uh, interpretive dance in the background while he's murdering people. Don't know. Um, Fade Rowther, he's psychotic, yeah, but well, because he's got his tongue stuck out, yeah. There's the Emperor Christopher Walken, 
Actually, I, did, I missed him. Missed him first time round. Must have been a blink and you miss it. We see Florence Pugh as well. Oh, but that folk Florence Pugh we saw earlier on. Um, that's not no. That's uh, Rebecca. What's her face? Isn't it? That's his mother, uh, the lady Jessica, who becomes the um, the Fremen's um, like um, what they call Bene Gesserit witch person, um, whatever they call her. mother, like a mother superior. That's what they call them, don't they? Sort of thing. Um, do you want to show us it? There's Fade Rowther again. No, I'm not going to end up dropping that. Uh, that we saw reading something. That wasn't Florence Pugh, was it? It didn't look like her to me. It didn't have her eyes. Florence Pugh's got amazing eyes. I'm not going to. I'm not going to drop on her, am I? No, no man. Whatever. Anyway, it looks fine to me. I think it looks good. I don't think it looks boring at all. It looks really good, and I did like the first uh, part of it. Um, uh, let me get rid of that. I did like the first part of it. Um, yes, he's a Hessian. <laughs> he's the emperor. <laughs> oh, ah, ah, with his teeth filed. There's no um, ho um, yeah, Jose Ferrer, is it? Well, Jose Ferrer in the the um, um, David Lynch one. But anyway, I think it looks good. I think it looks good. By the way, I've still, I still haven't watched... Speaking of June, got that 4K. Still haven't watched it. Where are we? There we go. That's the 84 one in 4K. Still not got round to watching it. <sighs> one of these days. I will one of these days. Right, let's get on with the rest of the news. Um, all the, the, the links for all these, these uh, news stories are in the description. Um, so later on, I'll put a... Um, uh, time stamps in and all that. So anyway, so just thought I'd mention that. Right, let's go on with the rest of the news. Right, straight. Oh, off we go. Doctor Who first. Um, as usual, I've not read any of these stories, so they could be all nonsense, <laughs> or they could be uh, uh, controversial. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Right, Doctor Who blew its big hand off. A satisfying trilogy gets soured by an asterisk. Uh, what, that little Gaulish fella that uh, stood up against the Romans? Asterix. I know, I know. Right, it's Doctor Who. This is from, by the way, this is from uh, Polygon. Uh, Joshua Rivera. He, him. It's Doctor Who tradition that one Doctor's final episode is the next Doctor's first. This handoff is one of the coolest things about the show. You never really know what you're going to get, and everything feels new again. Last weekend, the guard changed once again. Uh, in another first for the series, following Jodie Whittaker's tenure as the first woman in the role. Unfortunately, the momentous occasion was marred by what seems like an incredibly boneheaded decision in how the transition was made. It was a bit naff, on it? <laughs> it wasn't very good. Well, I did enjoy all three of those episodes, those anniversary episodes. I did enjoy them for what they were. I understand why people are cross, and there were some, you know, bonkers bits in it that I thought, what, why, why have they done that? But uh, anyway. The 15th Doctor, however, is always going to have an asterisk by his name, a little footnote denoting that his introduction as actor Shooty Gatwa takes his historic place as the first black man to assume the role in Doctor Who's 60-year history. It's different from the rest. It makes the whole affair feel like an alarming step back right before what many still hope might be a great leap forward for the long-running series. Well, yeah, because it didn't, it didn't regenerate as such, did it? They called it a bi-generation, didn't they? But it didn't have the old energy coming out, you know, like the quickening sort of thing. They didn't do all that, did they? Uh, which is what everybody wants to see. It, they just pulled them apart, didn't they? They were like two in one, pulled them apart. And as Gary from Nerd Nerdrotic says, they were touching pee-pees. <laughs> The, or as I, when I saw it, I thought, joined at the hip, because they were for a while, weren't they? Uh, but anyway, they did it like that, as though as though he'd, I got the impression he'd been pulled, that the, the, the 14th Doctor, Doctor 10A, had become like a conduit or a portal for the 15th Doctor to be pulled through him, if you know what I mean, from another time. That's how I 
thought at first, that was my initial, I didn't say it at the time because I've, I've had time to think on it. So that's, that's what uh, I was thinking. Or oh, what were brewing in my head. But anyway. Uh, it makes the whole affair, I've read this bit, I'll read it again. It makes the whole affair feel like an alarming step back right before what st many still hope might be a great leap forward for the long running series. Uh, spoilers for the ending of the giggle follow, which I've just given you. <laughs> I've just told them. Uh, I have two head cannon thoughts, but uh, Russell T. Davis's comments make them less likely. It says Wing Grace. Uh, well, let us spill the beans. What are your two head cannon thoughts? Um, I don't, I, I'm baffled by what Russell T. Davis has been saying. Lately, I don't know. It's not. It doesn't seem the same person. It's like George Lucas. When George Lucas did the original trilogy, you know, with this visionary uh, filmmaker, and then when he came back to do the the prequels, it was like he was a different person. <laughs> when he did his special editions and then the prequels, it was like a a different fellow. Like the original George Lucas had he had brain damage or something, or you know, something that happened and. Um, it, it was just thinking differently, and Russell T. Davis seems like that. He yeah, seems to be thinking differently, in in uh, in my opinion. Right, number one, the Fourteenth Doctor will still regenerate as normal at his death, but the toy maker just pulled Shooty back early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's it. It was like it. It want a regeneration. It was a um, well, they call it a bi generate, but I'm, I'm not thinking of bi generate. I think the word by, the the little bit at the beginning, by, is deliberate, if you know what I mean. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that what the toy maker were up to has, has, create, has that says, pulled him pulled him from another time, which is why he said, what the hell's going on here? But, uh, but was he naked in that other time? I don't know. But anyway, uh, number two. The splintered multiverse was not allowed to split and it stabilised because it was in proximity to the toy maker's altered reality. This multiverse thing, and now they call the Hooniverse, whatever they're calling it, aren't they? Uh, it's another thing that they've, that they've just decided to create. Um, they've never really talked about multiverse in Doctor Who before. They've talked about, pardon me, how time, you know, is timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly and all that. But there's fixed points in it, isn't there, in Doctor Who? That's what they said. Oh, there's fixed points in time that cannot be altered, um, which kind of precludes there being multiverses. It's it's all one timeline, but, you know, you can it's a bit wibbly-wobbly in between the uh, fixed points. But, uh, no, no. but, yes, very good points, Wind Grace, very good points. Um, and, you know, but it doesn't seem like Russell T. Davis is thinking that way, does it? Because he's saying... Um, when the by generation happened for the 14th Doctor, Doctor 10A, um, it happened for every other Doctor as well, which is how we saw him again in um, the Tales from the TARDIS, the, the Doctors that are still alive, like Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy and them. Um, that's how we saw them, because suddenly there's there's all the other, all the other Doctors are now running around in the same timeline, or something like that. I don't know. I don't think he's even thought about it. Yes. Number three, Russell T. Davis just wanted his cake and to eat it too. Yes, exactly. Exactly, Win Grace. That's why you're a better reviewer than me. Because <laughs> you come up with stuff like that. <sighs> anyway, let's carry on with this article and see what they've got to say. At Polygon. As an episode, The Giggle, the last of the Doctor uh, Doctor Who's 360th anniversary specials, is a hell of a ride, if a bit dense. The premise involves a subliminal message hidden in every screen, everywhere, driving the world mad. Uh, as other people have said, they kind of stole a lot from previous Doctor Who stuff, you know, what Russell D. Davis had written himself um, in this episode. But um, obviously I, I didn't twig, because I'm an idiot and I'm... I'm I don't notice things. <laughs> That's why I'm not very good at reviews. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, the sig hidden signals and stuff like that. Um, there we go. The premise involves a subliminal message hidden in every screen, everywhere, driving the world mad, a heavy-handed metaphor that would drag the whole episode down if the story dwelled on it much. Thankfully, it doesn't. No, 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 no. 
Writer Russell T. Davis mostly uses this plot for spectacle's sake to give the episode an apocalyptic scale. He puts much more energy into the episode's villain, the Toy Maker, uh, which he should, because he was quite good, actually. One of um, Neil Patrick Harris. Um, but anyway, a deep pull from Doctor Who history, the Toy Maker first appeared during William Hartnell's The Very First Doctor, remember? <laughs> Not the little girl, the little ethnic, not ethnic, can you say ethnic? Diverse girl uh, that fell off a cliff. Um, or the other one, uh, I forgot her name, Joe, somebody or the actress, I think. Um, I can't remember her name, but, um, you know, the other. Anyway, <coughs> during William Hartnell's tenure on the run, uh, he's not shown up on screen since, but still resurfaced in the odd Who novel or radio play through the years. In casting Neil Patrick Harris to resurrect the role, Davis finally gives the three specials a sense of history that this trilogy of specials has been lacking, one that stretches back to before the modern era of Doctor Who Davis kicked off in 2005. And there he is, dancing. As London burns... The toy maker also thrusts us into the new era of Doctor Who, a creature from beyond the universe who sees all of existence through an A-model lens of games and play. The Doctor's plan for defeating him involves challenging him to a game. Only in the sort of logic loopholes Doctor Who is so fond of deploying, the toy maker demands to play the next Doctor and shoots a beam right through the Doctor's chest. Uh, which is fair enough, because it beat with the William Hartnell Doctor uh, oh, the, the William Hartnell Doctor, sorry, beat him. Then the David Tennant um, Doctor got beat, and now he wants to play the next one. So, you know, I suppose that makes sense. I suppose. But he didn't end up fighting uh, or playing against um, the 15th Doctor. He ended up playing against both of them, didn't he, at the same time? Anyway. This is where the giggle falls apart. Instead of regenerating into Shooty Gatwa's 15th Doctor, something weird called bi-generation happens and the Doctor splits in two. David Tennant's 10th ten Doctor. I like this. I like whoever oh, this fellow who wrote this. I like the cut of his jib, Joshua Rivera. <laughs> uh, David Tennant's 10th Doctor and Gatwa's 15th. It's not a temporary thing either, either. A minute. Hey. I can hardly see the screen for this bloody Christmas tree. <laughs> it's not a temporary thing either, either. As the special's den denouement plays out, it's made very clear that 10 will remain alive and well, albeit settling down into the role of fun alien uncle to Donna Noble's family off screen. Our 15 goes off to do Doctor Who things. They each even get their own TARDIS. Which I hated that bit. With his big Harley Quinn mallet. <sighs> still say he should have just opened the door and there'd been another TARDIS control room in there and he should have gone in there done his switches and things and it whoosh, whoosh, done the noise that, what, what was, what's the warp the warping noise then he'd have disappeared from that rod the door had closed and then another TARDIS had appear, could have appeared outside you know the TARDIS could have copied itself or whatever rather than just hitting it with a mallet which was stupid with a ding noise but could be argued that he used that because it's to do with games and stuff fun fa fun fairs and all that could be argued couldn't it but still stupid anyway the whole thing smacks of cowardice in making the wildly inconsistent decision to make the first black doctor a weird anomaly that keeps the previous white one in play it kind of suggests that you keep him, you're keeping a spare doctor around in case the new one doesn't work out. That's what it, it smacks of, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, it just does. Uh, Gatwa's 15 is now categorically not the doctor, undercut by the fact that the other guy is still out there, even if he never actually shows up. Yes, he's just a doctor, isn't he? Anyway. Uh, there are charitable ways to read why this happened. Uh, yes. 
Win Grace. Breaking case of emergency doctor. That's what he's there for, isn't it? <laughs> but it's written into his contract as well, David Tennant. That uh, if 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 RTD phones him up, he's got to come running. Drop everything and save us. That's what <laughs> that's what he's there for. There are charitable ways to read why this happened. Davis's Doctor Who work is uh, is best characterised as extremely sentimental and his plots will frequently toss out logical sense if the emotion of a scene makes sense to him. As a sentimental writer, it's very possible that Davis could not bear to kill his most loved Doctor a second time or that the symbolism of Tennant's Doctor wishing Gatwa's good luck and sending him off struck him as more emotionally befitting such uh, uh, struck him as much more emotionally befitting such a historic handoff remember tenant when he first regenerated he said he didn't want to go didn't he that was his, his, one of his last lines wasn't it i don't want to go or something like that uh, looking at this, uh, looking at it this way, however, strange credulity, and there's little reason anyone should be so generous. Doctor Who, under the tone Davis himself set in 2005, has established itself as embracing a sort of matter of fact. Prog- well, I'll learn to read and speak one of these days. Progressivism that channeled the optimism of science fiction to show how humanity could, in fact, better itself over time. To that end, the series has often, albeit clumsily, worked to be inclusive and compassionate in fits and starts, matter-of-factly introducing queer characters, including Donna's trans daughter Rose, in the 60th anniversary specials. Is she trans, though? I don't know. I think she just identifies as female. I don't think any surgery or whatever has gone on. She's only 15, for God's sake. But anyway and endeavouring to make the Doctor's world a little less lily-white. We could be better, and the Doctor was there to cheer us on. What makes this sort of gaff all the more frustrating and almost retrograde? No, oh, sorry, which makes this gaff? So, is it? Which makes this sort of gaff all the more frustrating and almost retrograde? It's the kind of mistake you'd think prominent creators were done making. Granted, the ending of this story is not written yet. We're still in between seasons, with a Christmas special episode left to give Gatwa's Doctor his first proper adventure before he kicks off his run in earnest in 2024. I'm not looking forward to the one, <laughs> the Christmas special. Them goblins look terrible, and it begins with Buddy Doctor in a. It's going to be. It's a gay nightclub, isn't it? When all said, I bet it is. Giving it all that. I'm sorry, but uh, you know. It's a bit much, and I know it's been designed, well, written because apparently Russell T. Davis met his husband um, in a nightclub and their eyes locked across the nightclub, and this it's a, basically a recreation of that, apparently. <sighs> don't say, write what you know, but don't, don't write yourself. No, but a writer always puts themselves in their stories, don't they? It's natural, I suppose. You know, don't go too far. It's possible that Davis plans to address the way the giggle reads as making the first black doctor seem like a carve out that allows regressive holdouts to stick to their white doctor. TV is a serial medium, and the push and pull between audience and artists is part of the game. Uh, Wingress says, uh, just want to mention it, since I haven't seen anyone mention it, but doesn't the new TARDIS look like Cerebro from X-Men? Uh, I suppose, yeah, a bit, yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get that, but uh, I, now you mention it, <laughs> yeah, I suppose it does. Uh, it it kind of gave me the vibe of the, you know, the original TARDIS, you know, which had the circles on the walls, but there were bigger ones, weren't there? Uh, and the TARDIS control room was a lot smaller in the olden days, wasn't it? So it gave me a vibe of of that, but uh, but, but but round instead of you know rectangular. But yes, you're right. It does. It does uh, have that sort of vibe, uh, which is now a Disney a Disney thing, isn't it? Now and now Disney remember uh, stumping up lots of money for this new Who. Uh, it's probably why they felt that they could use the uh, Avengers Tower in it. For, for unit, for unit HQ, because Disney probably said, go for it. Anyway, Gatwa, for his part, is incredible. 
Uh, I won't go that far. Even without pants, it's not the not this better than eyelid. There were a, a fella running about with with no trousers on, uh, which he never manages to put on before the credits roll. The fifteenth Doctor shines in the last few moments of the giggle with a grin that can light up the sky and an eagerness to see everything and go everywhere. It's a testament to his talent and charm that makes it feel like waiting to see how this all plays out will be worth it. We will see. We will see. But they kind of made out that the Doctor were tired all of a sudden. Uh, worn out, essentially. The time war, I suppose, and losing the companions and all that. They tried to do all that, didn't they? And he, he was just tired, tired of it all. So they needed this new Doctor to come out who didn't have all that emotional baggage, you know, character development, and um, is just going off being all happy and dancing in nightclubs and going around uh, having adventures with Ruby Sunday. Anyway, uh, Wingress says uh, they had lots of uh, other Marvel and Disney things hidden around the sets too, did they? Oh, well, I said, I'm not very observant. <laughs> Uh, but that mallet was very DC. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a, a decent article, in my opinion. Um, yep, the the blew its big hand off because, as it as I said, uh, it, it's not a te technically it's not a regeneration. I think it's been just been in my head canon is just being pulled from another timeline or whatever another time. Um, so it's, it's technically. Not um, it's the Doctor from the future, essentially, uh, before David Tennant does his proper regeneration. But anyway. But what about Doctors after him then? <laughs> they said, you know, the bi-generation happened for all the previous Doctors as well. What about all the ones that are to come? Dunno, dunno. Anyway, let's move on. But... Uh, but as I said, I did enjoy the uh, the episodes. For what they don't, technically, I enjoyed the stories. It were the little bits, you know, that that niggled at me. But uh, for the you know, on on the whole, so to speak, uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed them all. Right, let's move on. I think I don't know how many Doctor Who stories we've got. Might be three. We'll see. Yes, it is. We've got three. We've got some Doctor Who, some Star Trek. Uh, quite a lot of Star Trek actually today. Uh, a bit of Spider Man, a bit of Stargate, and some Abyss. There we go. Uh, where are we? Uh, the wrong thing. There we go. Right. Speaking of uh, by generation, there you go. <laughs> the, the thing with two brains. Ray, um, oh, I forgot the name of that. Uh, Ray Milland, and I can't remember the other actor. Um, Anyway, uh, classic uh, <laughs> sci-fi horror comedy. Anyway, this is from Inverse, uh, Dace Johnston. Doctor Who's wild new plot hole could be solved by a time loop. With two Doctors coexisting, how exactly does the linear flow of time work? This is uh, you know, what I've just mentioned, really, and it's kind of uh, about all these bi-generating Doctors. <sighs> right, anyway. The... I'm going to have to re-watch it, by the way, because they ended up sharing clothes, didn't they? We see, like, David Tennant kind of has an undershirt under his overshirt. Uh, good job he were wearing undies, isn't it? <laughs> Tidy whities That would have been embarrassing. We didn't have, like, a thong on or something. <laughs> uh, that would have been funny. Anyway, right, off we go. The Giggle, the third and final Doctor Who 60th anniversary special, was more than just a laugh. After two adventures with David Tennant back as the 14th Doctor, or 10A, uh, a bout with the toy maker and the nasty unit laser, uh, laser, forced him to regenerate again. Pardon me. But just like last time, this wasn't a normal regeneration. Because uh, last time he regenerated, his clothes regenerated as well, didn't they? When he went from Jody to David, uh, his clothes regenerated, uh, which I think has happened before. I'm sure it has. I can't remember. 
But just like last time, this wasn't a normal regeneration. The 15th Doctor, played by Shooty Gatwa, split from the 14th Doctor like a cell undergoing mitosis. Uh, while this was an exciting development for those hoping for a Tenant-led spin-off, it caused a lot of questions about just how the timeline works, and most importantly, what happens to the 14th Doctor when he inevitably dies. But one line from the episode may reveal a theory that could solve Everything. Uh, and there he is again. Uh, after the 14th and 15th Doctors come to terms with the bi generation, which was previously thought just to be a myth. That's just Russell T. Davis saying it. <laughs> I can't explain it. I haven't worked it out. So it's a, um, um, I forgot the name now, uh, from Star Wars. Um, Force Awakens, um, uh, another story, uh, uh, a good story for another time. That's what it is, isn't it? Thought to be, just be a myth. Um, the two figure out the logistics of how their coexistence will work. While 14 is giving him a tour of the TARDIS, 15 reveals why he thinks the bi-generation happened because the Doctor has never stopped to rest. Uh, all the Doctors just kept running, never stopping to feel their feelings or cope with the massive losses they've encountered over the years. But they have, though, aren't they? Plenty of times we've seen the Doctor just stop and not do anything, haven't we? You know, have a, things things have happened around him that he's no control over, but plenty, many times he's, he's, he's gone somewhere just to you know, have a breather and have a, a bit of relaxation. But then, you know, a catastrophe happens. Uh, so it's not his fault, is it? Uh, anyway, well, uh, but you're fine, 15 says, because I, I'm fine because you fixed yourself. This seems to mean that 15, as he exists now, has all the memories that 14 is going to make with Donna and, and her family and is benefiting from his previous self-care. Like I said, is the, is, the, is the doctor from the future that was pulled through a time portal through this fella? Oh, you can't see me point him through the David Tennant. So he acted like a portal, pulling the 15th Doctor through time. And eventually he'll do a re proper regeneration into him. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe we'll see it. I don't know. Uh, if that's true, it means that when 14 dies, he will simply cease to be. His regeneration into 15 is simply an advance on what would have happened later. Or maybe we will see it. Uh there's even more evidence for this theory if you know where to look. Donna tells 15 he's younger because you came after him, so you're the older doctor. I don't, I, I, I'm trying to work that out at the time. I thought, hang on, he's younger because you came after him. I thought, that, uh, um, no. <laughs> um, if the two were truly born at the same time, that would make them the same age. But if 15 has the lived experience of 14, then he'd be a good deal older. Like every good Doctor Who plot twist, there's timey-wimey stuff involved. Uh, in this case, a good old-fashioned bootstrap paradox. 15 tells 14 he needs to take a break and get better because that's what he was told. So there's a time loop going on. Looks like the DVD extra in Blink. That statement has no origin. It exists in a loop folding in on itself. It may have Completely torn up the Doctor Who playbook, but this theory could actually restore some order. We won't see two branches of the Doctor regenerating on their own divergent paths from here and on out. Instead, the 14th Doctor is just sticking around a little while longer and enjoying a well-deserved semi-retirement. In that case, why does he have another TARDIS? Don't know. Uh, there, there we go. So there we go. Um, yeah. I don't think Russell D. Davis has thought that far ahead, to be completely honest. <laughs> I don't think he has. I think he's, I think he's, he's written this and, and written the new series that's coming up. And maybe it'll, you know, maybe maybe he'll have answers to come. But I don't think he will. I think he's thought, we'll, we'll work it out later. Because uh, they generally have like three seasons ish, don't they? The doctors, each doctor generally has about three seasons. So he's probably thought, or series, as we call them. It's probably like, we'll, we'll figure it out later. Uh, but we just need to get him in and uh, get get uh, Shooty up and running. And uh, David's doctor can be uh, chilling 
chilling with the nobles. Uh, well, technically the temples, but they don't want to be called that. Right, what's next? What was next? I'm still not looking forward to that bloody <laughs> Christmas special. I'm not. I think it's going to be awful. That trailer didn't do anything for me. And the bloody there's a song in there which I've not heard, the Goblin song or something. I've not heard it, but I know it's out, and it's going to be the bloody Christmas number one here in the UK, apparently. It might be the best song ever. I don't know, because I've not heard it. <laughs> anyway, Doctor Who, the war doctor begins. Enemy mine arrives from Big Finish. This is on Flickering Myth. Uh, Andrew Newton. Big Finish Productions has today released the final volume of Doctor Who, the War Begins series. The War Doctor, sorry. The War Doctor Begins series. The series has been adding to the mysterious War Doctor's early adventures since the summer of 2021. And this finale, titled Enemy Mine, which is a cool film, <laughs> uh, starring Dennis Quaid and Lewis Gossett Jr., sees the War Doctor's early skirmishes come to an end. I don't think this is related to that. And there's John Hurt looking kind of like Bilbo Baggins for some reason. The finale features three audio adventures that conclude the story of Case, the berserker-class cyborg-Dalek-human hybrid, fighting in the Time War. Case is voiced by Ajaz Awad. Apologies if I've said that wrong. And the War Doctor uh, features the voice talents of Jonathan Carley, who has won well-deserved acclaim for his sim similarity to the late, great Sir John Hurt. Yes, he passed away, hasn't he? Uh, by the way, I've never, ever listened to a big Finnish Doctor Who thing. I've never ever listened to a big Finnish anything. Um, audio books are not my thing. I've got one, uh, and it's uh, Star Wars um, Revenge of the Sith uh, audio book on CD. Um, that's the only one I've got, the only one I've listened to. Anyway, In the Hybrid's Choice by Ajaz Awad Ibrahim, uh, related to him, Probably. The War Doctor believes uh, Case to be dead, but the fate of the Dalek human hybrid may be much worse as she's recruited by the enemy. Oh, she. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with Case's inner self being in conflict, can the Dalek time strategist find a way to seal her fate? Uh, Fear Nothing, written by Mark Wright, sees the Doctor's search for Case being interrupted by Commodore Tamasan, who forcibly brings the TARDIS to a remote TARDIS dry dock facility at the edge of the war. That sounds cool, a TARDIS dry dock. While well, she makes the Doctor a dangerous proposition. Uh, Case has been sent on a mission to eliminate a key Time Lord asset that could change the course of the war. Finally, in Exit Strategy by Matt Fitton, neither the Dalek Time Strategist nor the War Doctor have given up on Case, but whether she can be saved, and even if the War Doctor is the man to save her, waits to be seen. The War Doctor's Jonathan Carley is joined by Beth Chalmers, Vecklin, Adele Anderson, Tamasan, Nicholas Briggs, the Daleks, obviously. Becky Wright, uh, Jodal, Jodal, I don't know, Louise Faulkner, Greylis, uh, that's a Game of Thrones name, that, isn't it? And David Monteith, uh, that name rings a bell, the nurse. Actor Jonathan Carley said, it's the end of an era. When Ajaz first appeared as Case way back in Warbringer, I always felt there was more to her story that it would be, gr and, th and thought it would be great if we could revisit that. Clearly, everyone else felt the same. Producer David Richardson added, and so the beginning ends, it's the final box set of The War Doctor Begins as we reach the conclusion of the story of The War Doctor and Case. It's a turbulent and emotional final chapter with a very special appearance as Paul McGann warps in as the Eighth Doctor. How can he appear alongside his later and forgotten incarnation? All will be revealed, maybe the bi-generate. Doctor Who, The War Doctor Begins, Enemy Mine, is available uh, now from the Big Finish website as a collector's edition CD box, box, set, box set with digital download for $19.99 or digital download only for $16.99. For an extra three quid, you get all the CDs and whatever else comes with it. Digital, bloody rip-off out of the digital download. 
Unbelievable. And there's the cover art. With the, I presume that's Case. And there's the uh, John Hurt with Bilbo Baggins. And there's Paul McGann. Uh, so there we go. As I said, I've never listened to a, a big finish. Uh, I never heard the really good. I should I should give them a whirl, shouldn't I? I should do. Right, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, Star Trek now for a while. Oh, did I press that right? I think I pressed another button as well. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I pressed F11. I think I, I, I hit one of the others as well. I hope it doesn't do anything. I bet somewhere's blown up, somewhere far away. Right, Star Trek Strange New World Season 3 begins filming. Yay! By the way, I've got a Christmas present from Aiden. Don't know. <laughs> Star Trek Strange New World Season 2 on Blu-ray. Uh, I saw it in the supermarket. I thought, oh, I get that. So that's wrapped up. It's under the tree. To dad love from Aiden. <laughs> if only he knew. Uh, right, Star Trek Strange New World Season 3 is underway. Davy Perez, one of Star Trek Strange New World's executive producers, confirmed with a photo on Instagram that the Star Trek prequel series is back to work following the Hollywood strikes. Paramount Plus renewed Star Trek Strange New Worlds for its third season before the WGA and Film Actors Guild strikes, which Hollywood Productions, um, which brought Hollywood Productions to... to which caused Hollywood productions to halt industry-wide. You know what I mean. Fans remain eager to learn how the Star Trek Strange New World Season 2 cliffhanger ending will resolve. I hope it's better than it started with, with Captain Park going, Oh, oh, no, I don't want to go. With the unions, and I like Strange New World. I just, they always mess up the last episodes, don't they? The season finales. Anyway, with unions and studios having reached agreements, work is resuming across the film and television industry, including on Star Trek Stadium New Worlds, which films in Toronto into. <laughs> what? Is that supposed to be on Tower? I don't know. Uh, by the way, this is from comicbook.com. Uh, Jamie Lovett. A previous report suggests Star Trek Strange New World Season 3. I wish they didn't have this bloody blue bar here across the screen. It's dead annoying. It's right off-putting. Can you get rid of it? Is there a way to... No, it does that, doesn't it? Does that take that off? No, it just makes it black. Never mind. Uh, a previous report suggests Star Trek Strange New World Season 3 will continue filming through June 2024. While Paramount Plus has not confirmed a release window uh, for Star Trek Strange New World Season 3, that timing, if accurate, likely means the new season won't debut until 2025. Boo! Paramount Plus also has not confirmed the episode count for Star Trek Strange New Worlds, but the first two seasons consisted of 10 episodes apiece, making it likely that Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 3 will have the same. And here, he read the drum roll. Is the Instagram photo. <laughs> David Perez, executive producer. Obviously on the Enterprise set. Uh, oh, there we go. Strange New World, season three, day one of shooting. Time to get back in the chair. Hashtag Star Trek. There we go. Uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds nearly began production ahead of Hollywood's writers and actors' strike. Producing director Chris Fisher revealed exactly how close they came during an episode of TrekMovie.com's All Access podcast. I was going to direct the premiere episode. I had storyboarded pretty much the entire first episode, Fisher said on the podcast. That's how close we were to starting shooting. Uh, we were one day away from flying the actors in. We were like, do we fly the actors in? That's when it went above my pay scale. Fisher said that he and the show's other producers were planning how to get production started quickly once the tracks ended. That planning, presumably, led to where the show is now. Uh, so they've messed about, have they? They've got on with it. They've rolled the sleeves up and thought, right, let's get, let's get back to work. Myself and the producers up in Toronto, we kind of say, OK, the strikes end at the end of this month. What would happen? Fisher explained. Uh, what would we need to, to do that? What would, need, what would we need to do to then get going? And then once the strike passes that, uh, then we set it for the next month. Uh, we're not that many weeks away from being able to start absent all the other conflicts which may have arisen by now. 
Right, Star Trek Saves New World, season two, season finale, saw the Enterprise responding to a distress, d- d- distress call from a colony outside of the United Federation of Planet Space that had come under a gone attack. Starfleet recommends against getting involved since the colony is outside Federation borders, but the crisis is personal for Captain Pike because of the USS Cayuga's involvement. Who oh, me? That ship is commanded by Captain Marie Battelle. Yes, we found out her first name in the very last episode. Melanie Scrafano, with whom Pike has a complicated romantic relationship. The Gorn ship destroys the Cayuga before the Enterprise arrives. Pike takes a team of volunteers to search for survivors. Dr. Mabenga, uh, Babs, all the sand McCun, all the sand. Sal- Babs. Um, Lieutenant La'an Nooney and Singh, Christina Chong, who's got a new record out, apparently, haven't she? Uh, it's like FU for Christmas or something. And Lieutenant Erica Ortegas, Melissa Navier, join the away team that heads down to the colony where they find Captain Battelle, Montgomery Scott, Martin Quinn, uh, and several other survivors. Unfortunately, only Pike, Battelle, and Scotty make it back to the Enterprise as the gone beam up the rest of the survivors, including the away team to their ship as prisoners and several additional gone ships arrive. The finale ends with the crew awaiting Pike's order to attack or retreat, a decision made more tense for fans who know that La'an and Erica aren't part, aren't a part of the Enterprise crew by the time Captain Kirk takes over to start the original series for one reason or another. Or maybe they are, maybe, you know, maybe they are, maybe it just doesn't matter. <laughs> Because I think they're just going to remake the original series um, or reboot it, so to speak, uh, at some point. Uh, oh, that's it. There we go. Star Trek Season World is streaming now on Paramount Plus. Both Star Trek Season World seasons are available on Blu ray and DVD. Yes, because I've got the Blu ray. Uh, or I'm going to. For Christmas. Yeah. Cool. So that's that's uh, back to filming. So they're off, they're off and running. Um, Right, so cool. I'm happy about that because I like Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I don't care what anybody says. Yes, I know a lot of people hate it and, and all that, and I understand why, but I like it and I can't help it. You know, I just do. <laughs> can't help it if I like it. I could lie, couldn't I? I could lie and say, no, it's rubbish, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. If I like something, I'm going to bloody say I like it. Right, what's next? Um, yeah, we'll do this one next. We're going hard. Right, sticking with Star Trek. Let's have a few Star Trek stories. Sophia Butella uh, wants to return for Star Trek for whenever it happens. Sophia Butella made a big impact as Jailer in Star Trek Beyond. Uh, Yes, such a big impact. Uh, she was my first pop vinyl <laughs> as a jailer. Uh, and the star wants to return for Star Trek 4. We'd love to see it happen with the digital fix and Tim Tom Beasley. Not Tim Beasley, Tom Beasley. There she is as jailer, who I really like. Maybe it's the eyelashes, I don't know. Uh, we could write a book about how long we've been waiting for a new Star Trek movie. It's been seven years since the brilliant Star Trek Beyond I won't go that far. It were okay, you know. It were the best of the, uh, you know, the J.J. Abrams produced films. And that's as far as I'd go. Uh, Give us our last big screen visit uh, to one of the great sci-fi universes, but there's no sign of anything new. But if Star Trek IV does ever happen, it can count on Sophia Butella being ready and waiting to come back. Because, like I said, she, 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 went, she was going to the academy, so she was going to be like an engineer or something, wasn't she? Star Trek Beyond introduced Butella as one of its new Star Trek characters, Jailer. She's an alien scavenger who forms a bond with Scotty, and by the end of the film, she joined the Starfleet, the Starfleet Academy. This seemingly laid the table for future appearances in Star Trek movies, and Butella is well up for it if the Star Trek IV release date ever comes around. Um, not, not with this lot, I don't think. I would love nothing more than to go back to this character, Butella told the digital fix while promoting the Rebel Moon release date, uh, which I'm looking forward to. I'm sorry, I am. I love Jayla so much, and I love the whole cast. I would love to work with everybody 
uh, and on this project again, of course. Uh, Batella also has no concerns about getting back into the makeup chair for her transformation into jailer, saying there's no jailer without that makeup. We're not sure we'd be quite so keen to spend that many hours in the chair, uh, though there's no denying that Butella gets to look very cool at the end of it. Yes, she does. I said my favourite character in the film. It's such a shame that we've not had uh, any new movies from the Kelvin timeline since Beyond came along. Uh, with cast member and long-time fan Simon Pegg on scripting duties with Doug, y Yuk, Doug Young or Doug Jung, I don't know. It was a propulsive and witty addition to the Star Trek timeline. It was good. I enjoyed it. Uh, so bits of it were annoying. Motorbike, music, you know. Music as a weapon. In space. Give me a we were excited to see where everything would go next, only for it to just stop in its tracks, uh, because it didn't make any money. It probably lost money, I think, didn't it? Uh, because Star Trek films shouldn't be like, you know, $200 million production budgets, uh, which they were, they, were, they were doing, weren't they? Or near enough. Uh, but anyway. Unfortunately, the reality is that Beyond struggled at the box office and ended up losing oh, they've got about $50 million, despite strong reviews. Yeah, it was the best of the, the Kelvin timeline films, uh, by considerable margin. Star Trek IV has been in limbo since then. Noah Hawley was attached at one stage, and so was One Division director Matt Shackman, while uh, we all know about the Quentin Tarantino rumours. You want to do a... Uh, a gangster one, didn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, based on the um, a piece of the action gangsters, only from the original series, I think. Uh, it's good to know, though, that if that uh, if the Ducks ever line up for this Star Trek series to continue on the big screen, Butella will be ready and waiting to play Jailer again. But for now, at least, Butella's focus is squarely on Rebel Moon. She leads the cast of Zack Snyder's sci-fi adventure, in which she plays a rebel warrior fighting back against the stranglehold the strange hold <laughs> of the ruling mother world. It's available on Netflix from Friday, t December twenty second. Da 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 da. Right, there we go. Yeah, that's nice that she's she you know she wants to do it. But I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think they're going to get a Star Trek for. I don't think they're going to get any more Kelvin timeline things. Maybe they could put her in. Um, you know, some of these new Star, but the TV Star Trek. Maybe they could have Jailer appear in one of those in. Somehow, in some way, I don't know how they'd work it out, but um, I'm sure they could. Uh, you know, they could have a multiverse thing where, you know, I know we're all having them, but where she she gets pulled. Or they could have her in Strange New World, couldn't they? It's sitting near enough in the same time as the Kelvin timeline, isn't it? So they could have her appear there, but just as this universe's version of Jailer, and she'd be exactly the same. Why not? Why not? They could do. But anyway, right, let's move on. Let's move on. We've still got more Star Trek to come. We have Robert Beltran next. Remember him? <laughs> Remember him? Uh, Robert Beltran. Oh, hang on. <coughs> there we go. Robert Beltran. Did they put the other one up? <laughs> you weren't looking at a spinning logo for like 10 minutes, were you? I hope not. Robert Beltran refused to revisit a controversial Chicote arc on Star Trek Picard. Uh, this is on Looper. Shane O'Neill is the author. Star Trek Picard burst onto the streaming scene in 2020, getting long-time fans of the Star Trek franchise caught up with one of their favourite captains, Jean-Luc Picard, Sir Patrick Stewart. <laughs> uh, except she shouldn't have the same backstory. Well, no, because it'd be different. If she were in this, if she were from the, you know, the Strange New World universe, she'd obviously be different, wouldn't she? But it could be the same character, wouldn't it? The same actress playing her. Um, but anyway. Do, 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 do. Where were we? Uh, of course, for this nostalgia-fueled last ride for the Star Trek The Next Generation icon, uh, it doesn't come alone. Fellow legacy characters like Data, Brent Spiner, and William Riker, Jonathan Frakes, also appear throughout the show's three seasons. And all the, well, and all the others as well in the final season. Uh, Robert Beltran's Chicote could have joined these Star Trek alums, but he ultimately turned the project down and avoided revisiting the controversial arc from Star Trek Voyager. 
On X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, yes, we all know that we know, Beltran revealed that he was offered to reprise Chicote on Star Trek Picard. Quote, I was offered an episode, first two, then one, in Picard, uh, but I simply did not like what they had written for Chicote, so I turned them down. I won't go into detail. Please do. But I have no animosity toward the, the Picard producers at all, uh, the actor wrote. Picard, season three showrunner Terry Metalis, Metalis, revealed that plans were in place early on to revisit Chakotay and Seven of Nines, Jerry Ryan's romance. I hated that. <laughs> it was a typical end of end of a Star Trek series of seven seasons, just to stick two of the characters together. They did it with Worf and Deanna and they're in, in TNG, and then they did it with... Um, 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 Ezri Dax and the Doctor in uh, Deep Space Nine, but Ezri was a new character anyway, wasn't she? And then they did it with, with the Voyager, uh, yeah, Voyager with Chicote and Seven of Nine. But anyway, in an alternate universe, they got married and now lead the oppressive confederation of Earth. Chicote would have served as the story's main villain. Or was this for season two then? It must have been, wasn't it? must have been. Um, Chakotay would have served as the main villain, which Metallus noted didn't sit right with Beltran as he revealed to Trek movie. Uh, considering how divisive Seven and Chakotay's romance has proven to be among Stark Trek fans, Stark Trek, Beltran and the Picard team were wise to avoid exploring it further. Uh, ah, yes, he was supposed to be that ball guy. Yes, the, the other husband she had. Right. Obviously, that was season two, then, wasn't it? So, it, 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 you know, he dodged a bullet there, didn't he? <laughs> uh, better than Rafi. Well, yeah. The crowbarring it in. I'm sorry, they do. Jacote, Seven of Nine, strike up a romance during the waning days of Star Trek Voyager, as they always do uh, in Star Trek, uh, for some reason. And even as this arc was folded, people didn't buy it now. Though these characters have uh, have their fair share of fans, most agreed that pairing them up and pushing their relationship so heavily and suddenly was the wrong move. If she were going to get with anybody, it'd have been Harry, wouldn't it? Because we had the hots for her from the beginning, didn't it? And they could have ended up getting back, getting together. Poor Harry. Anyway, all these years later, viewers are still talking about it and expressing their frustration over how it panned out. Uh, how they both got together when it started. All their romance seems to be totally rushed and forced. Totally unreal, comparing to Belana and Tom's relationship. Who wrote that? Uh, seek relationship build up over seasons. Yes, it did. I said Tom and Belana's relationship were amazing. They were amazing. Uh, yes, Harry wanted it too much, yes, at first. He always went, he always picked the wrong girl, didn't he? The wrong twin. <laughs> the Borg. And the unattainable something or other. Anyway. Um, by the way, the Delaney twins were super hot <laughs> in Voyager. They were. They just were. Delaney sisters, not twins, Delaney sisters. I think they were twins, though, aren't they? Yeah, they were identical twins, aren't they? The Delaney sisters. Anyway, I forgot where I was now. Uh, yes, Belinda and Tom's relationship were amazing. Like I said, they built that up, didn't they? Uh, you know, it didn't just come out of nowhere. They built it up. And uh, they ended up getting married and having a kid. At the end, yes, they were twins, yes. And super hot twins. Anyway. Right, wrote, uh, oh, wrote a since-deleted Redditor in a thread regarding Chakotay and Seven Surprise Romance. I said, it was a bit like, Worf and Deanna. I know the people say, oh, well, you know, Worf and Deanna, it wasn't that sudden, but it was really. <laughs> they tried to explain it, was saying, you know, she was Alexander's godmother, you know, Klingon version of it. So, you know, the, but no, no. Uh, much like Vorik and Torik, apparently. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, there was. Uh, is that is that the head canon? Is that the is that the official explanation? They're twins, Vodic and Torik. I don't know why. Oh, yeah, I must say I don't know why they didn't have you know uh, Vodic or Torik. I can't remember which were which now. Um, 
the one that were in, in uh, Next Generation, why they didn't have that on Voyage? Why, why, why wouldn't it? Just so they didn't have to pay the writer. Probably. <sighs> Where were we? Uh, in a separate thread on the topic, uh, Abodiak the Fickle agreed that them becoming a couple was rushed and expressed the belief that Chakotay lacked chemistry with everyone, aside from Captain Catherine Janeway. Well, yeah, because we all thought they were, were going to get together with Captain Janeway, didn't we? Kate Mulgrew. Oh, I still think he's hot. Oh, I like Kate Mulgrew. I always have. Uh, they confirmed that in novels, don't know about real canon, this is it. If it's not on screen, it's not uh, official canon, but fair enough. If they confirmed it in novels, that's good enough for me. You know, it. it what happens in the novels and in like the expanded universe is, you know, it, it tides you over until it happens on screen, doesn't it? <laughs> and then you get disappointed because if it's rubbish. If the on-screen version is not as good as what were in the novels, uh, which is probably usually what happens. Anyway, as for Ready to Face in the Blue, they felt the Voyager team simply came up with the romance angle for Chakotay's benefit. They commented in another thread, Voyager was rapidly becoming the Seven and Doctor show. Yes, the Doctor loved Seven, didn't he? I always wondered about the Doctor. I know it's the future and stuff, but it was kind of magic, wasn't it? I mean, how does... That all that programming that's gone into him, how does it work? How does it become sentient and exceed his programming and all? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Wingrace says, I prefer the idea that he's the same guy and they just got his name wrong, <laughs> and he didn't think it were logical to point it out. <laughs> but if you look in his official, if you look in his official Starfleet. Thing on Voyager, it says he's, he's the fella that we're in Next Generation. But people keep calling him the wrong name. Uh, which is kind of Vulcan, I suppose, because Vulcans supposedly don't like being sort of like called out to. Like, Oi, Vorik, come over here. Apparently they don't like that, do they? According, into the, according to the Star Trek, the, the, the motion picture uh, novelisation, they don't like it. Because Commander Sonak, when uh, Kirk calls out his name at the beginning, um, it's uh, it's grating to Vulcans, apparently, to have your name called out. Um, how does life become more than chemicals? Well, this is it. This is it. But it's... Uh, I don't know. That's it. It's just... It's, I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain. I can't explain what I mean with the Doctor. Um, anyway, why didn't his, his memories or whatever fill up again? You remember that episode? Quite early on in the run as well, wasn't it? Uh, where his, his experiences filled up his memory buffer or whatever. And so they had to wipe, they had to wipe the, um, like the emergency diagnostic program, um, so that he'd fill that up as well. And the sense of that, what happens when he fills that up? And they, oh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, or whatever. And they never, <laughs> never mentioned it again, did they? So they must have found some way to... Um, they must have bought loads of um, uh, external hard drives from some some dodgy uh, dealer or on a space station somewhere. Uh, all they had to do was ask the computer to create a doctor capable of defeating date. Yes, yes. That's all they had to do. <laughs> oh, hang on. Hang on. I've just remembered I've got my clip, haven't we? For when you, you say things that I, that I get. I can't remember where I put it now. Where is it? I, I understood I, that reference. I understood that reference. There we go. <laughs> I made that today. <laughs> but every time Wind Grace says something and I get it, uh, which is not often because I'm an idiot. Anyway. Um, I forgot where I won now. I forgot where I won. Oh, right. Seven and Doctor show. So they thought pairing Seven and Chakotay would help them broaden out an underdeveloped character. Um, Burden Mind 79 also touched on the potential behind the scenes reason for the relationship, theorizing that it only came about to put Chakotay and Seven in specific narrative directions. Uh, and not because it was a natural fit. Uh, well, yeah, the needed. What did they need? They needed Chakotay to be like um, uh, grieving in it at some point, didn't they? Because Seven of Nine had died or something like that. Uh, in the 
for Nile, he wanted something like that. Uh, though Robert Belt had turned down Star Trek Picard, he at least uh, at least he was able to reprise Chakotay via Star Trek Prodigy, free of any romantic Voyager baggage. Uh, yeah, apparently. Uh, but we didn't see much of him, did we? <laughs> um, I just have a jumble of misconnecting wires in my head. <laughs> at least the connecting. Mine are, mine are just all lagging lump, l l limply <laughs> on the inside of my skull. Uh, sometimes when I do that, some of them like connect and I remember stuff then. <laughs> That's what happens. Anyway, so there we go. So we're going to be, we're asked to be in uh, Star Trek Picard Season 2 as the husband of uh, Seven of Nines, uh, president of uh, the Terran, whatever, Confederacy, whatever they called it, didn't they? Yeah, Confederation of Earth. Uh, but he refused, so that's it. Dodged a bullet because season two of Star Trek Picard was bloody off. <laughs> Apart from the episode one, the first episode was pretty good, um, which I think Terry Metallus had most to do with, didn't it? And then for the rest of the season, he was like, stayed on as like, a producer or whatever, but he was concentrating on Picard season three, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, that would have been horrible. Yes, it would. Uh, but only because the season was bad, I guess. Yes, it was terrible. Say, apart from that first episode. Actually, the second episode wasn't that bad, where they were in the, the Confederation of Earth. It was when they travelled back in time and stuff that it got really bad, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, right, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, hold on. Get rid of that first. There we go. Try to be professional, Steve. I'll have another drinky. Right. Um, I'm sorry, but I had to... You know, I said the don't read. I had to scroll down because uh, that headline got me interested. The most exciting Star Trek movie is filming sooner than expected. And I saw that picture and I thought, who wrote this? <laughs> anyway, this is from the Digital Fix. Uh, just a minute. Oh, no, let me get it. Oh, I'll put it on. It's all right. We're fine. You didn't know what I was talking about then because I haven't bloody put it on screen. Never mind. Uh, Wind Grace says, talk about bait and switch. The first episode gives us all the things we didn't like about season one, only to rip them away. Yes, it did. It did. I said that first episode was pretty good. It was all those different starships and stuff, didn't we? And it were cool. We wondered what was going on with this bog and all that. And then it all went downhill from there, didn't it? <laughs> anyway. Right. The most exciting Star Trek movie, Snigger, um, that's me sniggering, by the way, uh, is filming sooner than expected. The Star Trek movies have been on pause as the franchise has returned to its television roots. But a new movie is finally on the way. A, a TV movie. Uh, but, you know, she's there, isn't she? Empress Giorgio, uh, which I never liked. I liked Captain Giorgio, but I didn't like Empress Giorgio. James Osborne, Digital Fix. Uh, while Star Trek IV remains firmly stuck in pre-production hell, it's not going to happen, Michelle Yeoh's Section 31 begins filming in a matter of weeks. The film will be the first Star Trek movie since 2016's Star Trek Beyond. Star Trek Section 31. Is it going to begin filming in a matter of weeks? I don't know, but anyway, we'll see. Star Trek Section 31 will be released on Paramount+, Plus, which is positioning itself as the go-to streaming hub for fans of the franchise. There's rumours it's going to be sold, Paramount+. Plus. I mean, somebody, I saw somewhere, somebody said uh, Skydance, uh, you know, that production studio, uh, had, um, could be in, in the, the picture to buy Paramount+. Plus. Uh, apparently, Paramount Plus is the second um, lowest earning or whatever. Um, it's the second to the bottom of the streaming services, apparently. Don't ask me what's bottom, I don't know. Of the main ones. Uh, the thought process behind this entire project, uh, but Michelle, you're the... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. And she, I do like Michelle, you She's amazing. Uh, just not as Empress Georgia. But I did like her as Captain Giorgio. She was very nice as Captain Giorgio. She was a good Star Trek captain. Uh, but she wasn't a good empress of the Terran Empire. Even though she seemed to be related to um, uh, Empress Sato. But anyway. 
Where were we? Where were we? Uh, while Star Trek Section 31 release date hasn't yet been confirmed, a summer 2025 debut now looks likely in line with the news that filming will begin on January 29th, 2024, as per Trek movie. In my opinion, she's irredeemable. Uh, pretty much. I mean, look at all those... Um, um... <laughs> Saru's people. I can never remember what they're called. Oh, she, she she ate them, didn't she? That's what she did. Uh, I don't like my... There we go. Yes. I don't like my heroes to have eaten alternate u universe versions of our stars. Kelpians. She ate all those Kelpians, didn't she? <sighs> and it got me mad as well, because in like other reviews of that, people say, oh, she's a cannibal. I'm like, no, she's not. <laughs> she's eating an alien. Uh, if she ate another human, she'd be a cannibal. Anyway, filming will reportedly last six weeks, concluding in March before post-production work begins. As with all Star Trek movies, the post-production period will likely be a lengthy one as extensive work is put into VFX. After all, almost all the franchise's films, barring The Voyage Home, include a degree of bombastic space combat between ships, and Section 31 will likely be no different. Uh, given the upcoming schedule, a first look at the new movie shouldn't be too far away, which could help uh, to give more insight into the plot of the movie and the cast list. Little has been announced about either of these elements, and in true Section 31 style, secrecy seems to be the byword at Paramount in relation to the film. We don't know about Section 31 style secrecy. Everybody knows about Section 31 now, don't they? There was a secret when they were on Deep Space Nine when they were first introduced. But then uh, in the new Star Trek canon, um, you know, everybody knows about Section 31. They even have their own badges, their own ID things, their own fleet. Look at me started. When Section 31 was announced back in April of this year, uh, I don't think that it was announced probably uh, not long after season one, I think, of uh, Star Trek Discovery. Probably about 2018 when it was first announced. Probably when the movie, when Section 31 movie was announced in April of this year, just after the Oscars, remember? Michelle Yeoh just won an Oscar, hadn't she? Anyway. Uh, I don't mind the idea of knowing about Section 31 post DS9, but not prior. Pretty, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Because they cause I, like, blew the whistle on them, didn't they? Did uh, Bashir and, and uh, Cisco and all them. Um, but uh, anyway. I mean, it, it was a bit iffy in Enterprise, wasn't it, with um, Malcolm and his dealings with Section 31. But uh, I suppose they kind of tried to keep it on the QT, didn't they? <laughs> but uh, everybody knows about them in New Trek. <sighs> Forgot what I want now. Uh, when Section 31 was announced back in April of this year, oh, I was talking to Michelle, you just won the Oscar, hadn't she? And um, so what are the... Well, it was supposed to be a series, wasn't it? Then, because she's won an Oscar, and probably her price tag went up. <laughs> uh, it's obviously a lot busier, I suppose. Um, it, they decided to make it a film. Uh, it was confirmed that uh, oh, uh, newly newly minted Oscar winner Michelle Yeoh would be reprising her role as Philippa Giorgio, a Star Trek character from the earlier seasons of Discovery, to lead the film. What do you mean by early? Yes, yeah, you were in from the beginning, from the very first episode, just as a different. A different version. However, the last time we saw Giorgio, she'd been catapulted back into the past to an unspecified date by the Guardian of Tomorrow. Knowing that she'll become involved with the titular Section 31, a clandestine, although everybody knows about it, Black Ops, although everybody knows about it, section of the Federation introduced in the Star Trek series DS9. Is it part of the Federation or is it part of Starfleet? Because in the Enterprise, they said it was part of the Starfleet charter, weren't the You know, Article whatever, Section 31, that's where it gets its name from. Part of the Starfleet charter. So does that still mean it's... it's oh, it's all confusing, isn't it? I don't know. It's feasible that we could see Giorgio play a role in the formation of the organisation or perhaps recruited later on in its, in its lifetime to lead a dangerous mission. Um, it could even be set in the 25th century and feature recurring characters 
that me book rods. I've got to do that. And feature recurring characters from the TNG DS9 Voyager era of the Star Trek timeline, featuring faces like Dr. Big Shea or Worf. Or maybe that's just wishful thinking. Um, I think it's a good point. We'd have to be Starfleet. That's what they said in Enterprise, didn't they? They were part of the Starfleet charter. You know, article whatever, section 31. Did that chap. Uh, bet they're going to tie section 31 into the time, please. I won't be surprised. I won't be surprised. The uh, temporal whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, either way, either way, alongside Strange New World Season 3, Section 31 is one of the most exciting Star Trek projects on the horizon. Fair enough, if that's what you think. Uh, whatever the details end up being, we're willing to bet that Section 31 is going to be a blast. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, I, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest. Uh, but you never know. You never know. You never know. Um, because New Trek loves tying concepts together. Yes, it does. Yes. We will see, won't we? Um, anyway, uh, before we move on, um, like I said, because, because of this, uh, oh, I've pressed the wrong button again. I'm on the wrong screen. <laughs> um, remember... Uh, I can't remember when, but recently I mentioned this, you know, productionlist.com, uh, where I saw a Star Trek reference. I've searched again for Star Trek, and it's only found this from recently. Um, there it is. Um, Star Trek Station 31 series, and it says shoot date, October 23rd, 2023, to December 8th, 2023. Obviously, that didn't happen because they're on strike, weren't they? Uh, in Toronto, uh, well, they want to strike in Toronto, or that maybe they got like you know non union Canadian actors or something. I don't know, I don't think this happened. Uh, this spin off is set to focus on a continuation of Captain Philippa Giorgio's Your Discovery Season 2 Adventures in Starfleet Section 31 Division. There we go, it even gives you all the names of the people involved and all that. And let's say it was supposed to be filming. At the back end of this year, just finished filming, according to that. But I don't think that happened. Um, so there we go. Station 31. <laughs> oh dear. Yes, deep station 31. Yes. Actually, sounds quite exciting, that one. Deep station 31. I'm headed to deep station 31, maximum warp. Anyway, so there we go. A bit. That's it. I don't think this means anything. I think a lot, of, as I said, we saw that one with that Star Wars thing, didn't we, recently? And I think uh, with the, the new Ray film, I think they just do these as like placeholder and put dates in where they hope it's going to uh, it's going to start filming. But I don't think you should uh, put bets on uh, about it. Anyway. Uh, why did they pick such a blurry picture of Chris Pine for the header? Um, I don't know. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> I won't pay any attention, to be honest. Uh, where is it? Oh, oh it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's because it's supposed to be in the background. Uh, maybe. Put her in the foreground, because it's about Section 31, and why have they put him in anyway? I don't know. <laughs> it's not, he's got nothing to do with it, has he? He's in the Kelvin timeline. But uh, anyway, never mind. Why didn't they just show somebody else from Star Trek Discovery or whatever? Uh, yes, maybe it's near Cold Station 12. Yes, yes, where all the uh, augments are stored in, on ice. Really. Right. Oh, get rid of that. Let's move on. What's next? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, oh, Spider Man. Uh, but not. <laughs> uh, no, before we start, uh, because clickbait Star Trek 4, yes. Oh, I did mention it at the beginning, didn't I? About, uh, you know, it's not happening or whatever. Well, it's up in the air. Yes, they did mention Star Trek 4, didn't they? And, me, and Star Trek Beyond, which that were a, a clip from, an image from. I believe when he's talking to Commodore Paris. Uh, I wonder if she's related to Tom Paris. On the, the Yorktown station, which I thought was way too big and technologically advanced. Maybe it was something the, uh, the Federation had found. I don't know, but I didn't like that Yorktown station. I didn't like it. Yorktown station singer song. <laughs> anyway, Spider Man. 
This from Screen Rant, Andy Bebacked. Sorry, Andy. Anne Hathaway opens up on lost Marvel movie role in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. There she is. Uh, I like Anne Hathaway. Uh, I think she's like one of these total package people. She can act and she can dance and she can sing and it makes me bloody sick. I hate people like that. I hate talented people. Uh, way too anachronistic. Yes, the Yorktown station. Yes, it was. I thought it was anyway. Uh, Anne Hathaway has opened up about almost playing the Marvel character Black Cat in Spider-Man 4. It appears that Tobey Maguire was perhaps done as Peter Parker after Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 project got cancelled, despite the promise both he and other casting choices like Hathaway held for a prospective follow-up film. I'd have loved it. I'd have really liked Spider-Man 3. I don't know why. Well, it actually did really well, didn't it? Was it the most successful of the Spider-Man you know, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, you know, made the most money, but it just got bad reviews, and so they decided not to do any more. And I really liked it. I've always liked Spider-Man 3. However, 2021 and uh, marked uh, the biggest year in recent history um, for the web crawler. Um, uh, as both Andrew... Sorry, I'm looking at 2021. It's 2023 now, but they're on about no way home. Uh, however, 2021 marked the biggest year in recent history for the web crawler as both Andrew Garfield and Maguire joined Tom Holland in The Spider-Man No Way Home cast, giving the world a live-action Spider-Verse adventure. Uh, and it was a decent flick. Uh, yes, it was studio meddling again. Yeah. I, but I still like Spider-Man 3. Uh, however, this hasn't stopped interest in what Spider-Man 4 could have looked like, which Anne Hathaway loosely addressed when talking about the lost opportunity of playing Black Cat in Raimi's Spider-Man 4. During a recent appearance on the Happy Sad Confused podcast, uh, Hathaway broke down how far the crew actually got in the production process before Spider-Man 4 was scrapped, sharing the following... Uh, I did not get into costume and did not read a script past the audition sides. I got the part and, yeah, uh, it just, I think that's probably more the producer's story to tell than mine, should they ever decide to tell it. Uh, the Spider-Man universe has gone on to be so enormous and so thrilling, it's just reinventing itself and all of those things, so I wouldn't want to make more of it than is necessary. Uh, is Spider-Man 4 actually happening? You never know, do you? You can never say never these days. Um, Windgrace says, Bruce Campbell was going to be Mysterio in Spider-Man 4. Uh, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. Because remember, he was in all the others, wasn't he? Uh, as different characters. Or as Mysterio. You know, the um, man of a million faces or whatever. <laughs> Uh, there have been rumours that suggest that Holland's Spider-Man 4 movie isn't the only thing being developed over at Sony Pictures. But Tom Holland says he's, he, he won't do it again or something unless it's, unless it's you know, worth his while or whatever. And he said that, hasn't he? Uh, they even have storyboards out there. Cool. Cool. Anyway. Uh, where were Earlier in 2023, Thomas Hayden Church, who played Sandman in Spider-Man 3, who I think were a really tragic character, um, who were just super unlucky, <laughs> uh, but did bad things and let his temper get the better of him. Uh, but I don't think, you know, he wasn't a baddie, but he wasn't an evil person. I, say, well, I thought Sandman were quite complex in Spider-Man 3, to be completely honest. Uh, but anyway... Uh, who played Sandman in Spider-Man 3 and Spider-Man No Way Home said that he was hearing rumours that they were looking at making Spider-Man 4 with Raimi and Maguire. Uh, to this point, Sony Pictures nor any representative of Maguire and Raimi have commented, they're pretty bold, uh, on Church's statement. That said, um, it's possible that Sony Pictures is still working out proper deals with Raimi and Maguire if it turns out the Spider-Man 4 rumour does indeed hold weight. It is worth noting that Church's comments came out in the early days of the Film Actors Guild strike, uh, while also being in the midst of the Writers Guild. That's nearly as bad as Wilst. In the midst of the Writers Guild of America strike, 
Uh, Minnie Maguire or any potential writers for Spider-Man 4 likely couldn't come out to clarify anything, even if something was in the works. The lack of direct debunking could suggest that perhaps Spider-Man 4 is a bigger possibility than some may think. But inversely, the chances of a follow-up sequel to an over a decade-old movie are inherently low, and the lack of debunking could instead be creatives attempting to, revo uh, to avoid revealing anything about the current future landscape of Spider-Man as a franchise. Note! Tobey Maguire's return as Spider-Man has led to many theories about uh, many theories that he will return once more in the multiversal plot of Avengers Secret Wars. With Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse also featuring Maguire and Garfield's versions of Spider-Man, not seeing it, uh, and with the book, because I'm a huge fan of um, the first of the, you know, that the animated. Spider into the Spider Verse, the first one, wasn't it? I wasn't a huge fan of it. It was it was okay, but I wasn't a huge fan of the animation style. It kind of made me feel a bit queasy. But anyway, uh, and with Beyond the Spider Verse similarly facing rumours regarding them appearing in a more active capacity, there is a chance that Spider Man Four could blossom out of the recent decisions to put Tobey Maguire's Marvel hero back in the limelight. If Maguire were to get his Spider Man Four film. Uh, there would indeed be a lot of interesting avenues to explore given these recent appearances, especially after his adventures in Spider-Man No Way Home and the large amount of time that has passed since the events of Spider-Man 3. Hopefully, if not sooner, 2024 will answer these Spider-Man 4 rumours once and for all. There we go. So, there we go. Hopefully, I'd like to see it happen and I'd like to see him call up Anne Hathaway again and put on the uh, the the black cosy with the white frill as black cat. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, just me. Uh, hopefully it'll happen, because I, like, I like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films. Um, it's made me want to watch them now, um, so maybe I will at some point, but whenever. Right, let's move on, because time uh, stops for no man. Nearly there, nearly the end. Uh, Stargate news. Don't often do Stargate news, do we? But it's not Stargate news. Uh, but uh, hang on, before we before we continue, uh, Black Cat and Catwoman typecasting. That's true. Yes, you were Catwoman once, you because we saw a picture of her as Catwoman, didn't we? In uh, Dark Knight Rises, wasn't she? Uh, I wasn't a big fan of that one. I'm not a big fan of the Nolan Batman films as a whole. You know, they're all right. I don't hate them, but. I prefer the, the earlier ones, you know, the ones that are more flamboyant, shall we say. <laughs> anyway, uh, these ones, hang on. I prefer them Batman films. Batman, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. I do, I'm sorry, I do. The Nolan ones are fine. The Nolan ones are fine, but, uh, you know, I prefer the earlier ones. Uh, and so does Wingrace Battle, look of it. Yeah. Uh, I like Batman Begins, best of the three. Um, uh, I don't know. I probably like them all the same. You know, they're all about the same for me. I don't like his voice. His voice does my head in. So, yeah, I probably like Batman Begins first, uh, best, because his voice isn't, isn't as annoying. As the films went on, I'm talking about Christian Bale, his voice just started getting more and more gravelly for some weird reason. You couldn't tell what he was saying <laughs> when he put his Batman cosy on. He was all like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, shut up, just talk normally. Talk like Adam West. Anyway. <coughs> Making himself cough now, putting a gravelly voice on. Anyway, Stargate. By the way, speaking of Batman Returns, we're doing that on uh, Magnificent Mondays next week, I think. I think it's the next one. I could be wrong. I think it's the next one. I think it's next Monday is Batman Returns. Because uh, it's a Christmas film. All the films in December and January the 1st. Um, Magnificent Mondays and uh, Point With Fear are all uh, Christmas-related. The festive period. Right, Stargate. Off we go. Whew. 
Here we go. Right. Uh, this is from um, uh, Gate World. Here we go. Uh, Darren at Gate World. Stargate's USS Hammond model will be a collector's club exclusive. Master Replicas has announced a paid membership program with early access to certain items starting in 2024. Uh, hang on. Before we, before we continue, uh, Wing Grace is saying, Danny DeVito almost lost his manhood in that film, didn't he? <laughs> Trying to work out how. <laughs> but... Uh, that's it. I've got the uh, hopefully it's in the special features. Hopefully, so hopefully I'll learn about that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, where were we? Right, Master Stargate Master Replicas has announced that it will release a model of the USS George Hammond, uh, one of Stargate Television franchise, one of the Stargate Television franchise's signature ships. I won't go that far. <laughs> uh, I think we see it like a couple. Of, it's mentioned, isn't it? And then do we see it once? I think I don't know. Maybe more than that. I don't know. Oh, the ship made several appearances on Stargate Universe. I thought it was just one. Never mind. Under the command of Colonel Samantha Carter, Amanda Tapping. There. Are you up, Joe? Yeah, we sell. Oi. Oh, the princess. Uh, there's a catch for those. Who are, hang on. There's a clip online. It involves a live animal freaked out with a penguin. <laughs> There's a catch for those who have been building their fleet of Stargate models, though. The Hammond will be an exclusive offering of for Master Replicas as, as newly announced Paid Collectors Club. The Collectors Club will launch December 15th. You're being naughty, yo! Princess is being naughty. The Collectors Club will launch December 15th with a price tag of 99 US dollars, 89 pound UK, 99 euros. That comes with a 10% discount on all purchases through 2024. 24 hour early access to all new products. Wow. Access to six special online events with showrunners and special guests. And most importantly for completionists, access to buy a set of exclusive, uh, exclusive ships for Stargate, Star Trek, Doctor Who, The Expanse. Why are they italic but not Stargate or Star Trek? The Expanse, The Orville Foundation and other genre favourites. And now so far, as Collectors Club exclusive are The Hammond, along with the fourth Doctor's TARDIS and The Tacky. Tachi, I don't know, from the Expanse. I can't remember the name of the main ship in the Expanse. <laughs> I can't. The Russell and Nante. Uh, that's the only one I know the name of. Uh, our understanding is that the club membership will not come with any free models, but that these items will be available for purchase exclusively to members. Uh, and if that's an example of what you get, uh, it's not very good, is it, to be completely honest? Uh, but anyway. That's the Daedalus in it, yes. USS Daedalus. So they're just they're just going to use the Daedalus mold and put uh, George Hammond text on it, other. And that, it's not, it's not, you know, 99, 89 quid a year. You get a bit of money off, you know. Sorry, sorry. The first two of the club exclusive ships still to be announced will be available on January 1st. While details on the Hammond's design haven't been revealed yet, we anticipate that the company that company will follow the fictional universe and stick with the existing moulds for the Daedalus. Yep. Uh, Wingers just wants a gate with a DHD. Yes, yes, I've got a gate. Oh, no. <laughs> can, you see, can you see it? Hang on. Make myself big. There we go. There's my star. Can you see it up there? I'm not shining a torch on it. <laughs> go. Can you see my stargate there? Look. <laughs> my little stargate. <sighs> Thank got a DHD though. So I can't dial out. I'd have to dial out manually. Uh, and luckily it hasn't activated at any point. Thank goodness. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, the existing modes for the Daedalus. As I said, just use use the existing mode and just replace that SS SS Daedalus or something. I don't know. Daedalus. Oh, it's AO2. I don't know. I don't know what it says. Uh, get a tiny Gary Jones to work it for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
seven chevron locked because he just likes changing it up for the last chevron, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, on television, the Hammond was the sixth Daedalus class deep space carrier following the Daedalus Odyssey Apollo Korolev, which was destroyed almost immediately, wasn't it? Had not seen on screen the Sun Tzu. The ships are functionally identical on screen, though the Odyssey did get those sweet Asgard core upgrades, uh, differing only in the ship's name emblazoned on the hull. Uh, the Hammond was originally slated to be christened Phoenix. It was, I thought it was going to be the... Um, I thought it was going to be a Russian one. No, i them wrong. But was renamed in honour of the late Major General George Hammond, first commander of Stargate Command. Uh, no, it wasn't. That was General West. Played by the great Don S. Davis. Maybe it won't call Stargate Command when General West were in charge. Uh, Master Replicas previously told Gateworld that it plans to release additional Daedalus class ship models, noting at the time that these may be limited editions or exclusives. The original Daedalus model was the first in the Hero Collector series from Eagle Moss, released in 2021. That company released three Stargate models before going out of business. Quite a few Eagle Moss. Up the rest are in my bedroom to move. Uh, well, uh, I forgot what I want. Uh, the Daedalus quickly sold out and was hard to find for a couple of years until Master Replicas acquired those original moulds and produced new units earlier this year. Uh, do you have any Stargate ships? Nope, no Stargate ships. Not Eagle Moss. They're all Star Trek ones. They're all Star Trek ones. Um, since then, Master Replicas has signed its own license for the franchise and picked up where Eagle Moss left off. Five ships are now available with the Prometheus shipping in January. Other new ships, prop replicas and figures for the Stargate license are expected starting next spring. So there we go. Uh, but like I said, I'm not, I'm not over impressed with that. Maybe it looks better. Maybe it's just because it's an overhead view, a dorsal view, so to speak. Uh, and not very well lit. Maybe it looks better in uh, proper lighting. Maybe. Anyway, so there we go. So there. If you join up, you get money off. And extra stuff as well. 10% discount. <sighs> anyway, I bet they're not cheap. I bet they're not cheap. Right. Let's move on. Let's move on. I think we've one story left and then we can bugger off. <laughs> yes, the abyss. The abyss. This is from Niche Gamer. Uh, Brandon Orselli. Cool name. There we go. The abyss 4K remaster is now available digitally. Uh, James Cameron's legendary underwater sci-fi film, The Abyss, it's, it's, well, it's not only legendary, it's kind of infamous, isn't it? <laughs> what he put his cast through. Uh, the Abyss is finally available on digital platforms after its depressingly brief theatrical rerun. Originally released back in 1989 and finally meticulously remastered under the direct supervision of Cameron himself, The Abyss is now available in 4K ultra-high definition on various digital platforms like Prime Video, Vudu and Movies Everywhere. Never heard of that. Uh, a, a price is set at $19.99. And the film was also upgraded with full Dolby Vision HDR and sports an excellent Dolby Atmos audio mix, making it truly the definitive way to watch the cult classic. I wonder if it's on British Amazon. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Where's my Amazon link? Where are we? Prime Video. The Abyss. Taylor Swift's on. Because she's there looking at me. <laughs> uh, nope, Ghosts of the Abyss. No, we haven't got it yet. Or maybe it's, you know, is it on? They say it's on now. Uh, yeah, finally available. Not in the UK, though. Not in the UK. Uh, Sphere, seven ninety nine 99 to buy. Uh, Sphere, I like Sphere. It's one of those films that, I, for some reason, I really like it. Um, uh, Thank goodness that you're going to say it's a streaming service remake. I mean, I bet there is one. <laughs> or, a, you know, a rip-off of it, you know, like a... Um, Shut up, princess. You know, like a, a asylum one. 
Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Pressure. A film called Pressure. Uh, video's currently unavailable. Never mind. I think the cat wants to go out. Do you want to go out? Right. Just bear with me for a minute. Got to let the cat out. She's been annoying. <laughs> I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Letting the cat out. Uh, not of the bag. <laughs> Just out of the house. Uh, Windgrace says, The Rift sounds like a movie title I've heard. Maybe that's Asylum. Uh, probably. Although I think... Oh, it might be for this. But I'm, I'm thinking, is it... No. <laughs> I'm thinking of... Um... Oh, what do they call that film now? One with the giant robots and monsters. I'm thinking of that one. Um, oh, what do they call that film now? You know, the Jaegers fighting the Kaiju. Uh, what that film now? <sighs> You're going to make me look that up now, aren't you? You're going to make me look that up now. The Rift movie. Dee 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 dee. The Rift sci-fi thriller from 2012. Uh, has it got a... Uh, uh, no, I'm just going to have to go to there. Go to the IMDb. No, that's something else, I think, is it? Uh, Blooming Um, let's try that one. Oh, that's just images. Come on, must be some info about it, is that it? Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, got a 33% score. <laughs> the Rift. Uh, we don't say anything about it. Uh, black rifts appear in the skies around Earth and something watches from the darkness. So that's not it, is it? That's in space. That's in space, not under the sea. Um... No, I can't find anything. The Rift 1990. Uh, no, I don't think that's it either. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, Pacific Rim. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Although they did an Atlantic Rim, didn't they? <laughs> did the Asylum. <laughs> didn't they? Um, and the rip-off. Oh, yeah, Atlantic Rim. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Anyway, where were we? Uh, da, 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 da. Here's a teaser for it. A theatrical rerun, which we won't look at. Uh, Diehard fans of the cult classic film will be overjoyed with the 4K remaster alone, but the digital release also includes all of the bonus content that will be included uh, in its disc release, uh, including brand new bonus features. It's no Transmorphers. I've not seen that. <laughs> I've not seen Transmorphers. In fact, I haven't seen a lot of the Asylum films. I've seen a couple of the Sharknado films. Um, but I can't think of any, many others I've seen. Um, no, I can't think of any. Uh, no. Anyway. The brand new bonus features include the deep dive interview and conversation with Cameron as he talks up the film, its production and more, as well as The Legacy of the Abyss, a mini-documentary exploring stories around the film, its production and its legacy. The Abyss stars Ed Harris alongside Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio and Michael Bean and follows a science fiction story in which a US submarine encounters an un unidentified submerged object only to tragically get sunk. 80 knots. Or was it 60 knots? Or was it 80 knots? I can't remember. It ends up going 120 knots, doesn't it? <laughs> they get caught in its wake. Spoilers. Uh, to recover the vessel, the US, US Navy SEALs are sent to a privately owned drilling platform as a base during their mission. Dr. Lindsay Brigman, Mastrantonio, insists on accompanying the SEALs 
uh, while her estranged husband Virgil Bud Brigman Harris is against it. Mystery and adventure ensue. And in the special edition version of the film, they even end up saving the world. Yes, they do. Uh, the special edition is miles better, in my opinion. Uh, they made a steampunk Sherlock Holmes Iron Man film with Malcolm Reed and uh, Yanto from Torchwood. <laughs> cool. That said, uh, I think the the Asylum films, I remember reading somewhere that um, all the films were made for under a million dollars and every single one of them made a profit. <laughs> uh, so that's their, uh, their re raison d'etre. Uh, get it made for under a million dollars and you know it, it's got to make a profit. And they all did. If you're looking to get a disc version of The Abyss in 4K, you'll have to wait a little longer as they won't ship until March 12th, 2024. Bloody hell. Expect to have a thorough review on The Abyss in 4K shortly. I say, waiting for The Abyss. What else are we waiting for? And uh, True Lies. I think they're the two big ones, aren't they? That we're waiting for in 4K. Uh, so I wonder when True Lies is coming out. Is it out already? I don't know. Shall we check? Let's have a look. Uh, where's my Amazon link? True Lies. Let's have a look. Nope, that ain't even on. Oh dear, it's not even on Amazon in the UK. Nope, not there. Not there whatsoever. Maybe it's on Disney Plus. Because it's a. Uh, I think it was a Fox film, wasn't it? Maybe it is. Anyway, never mind. Never mind. Um, right, so, uh, with that it, yes, that's it, that's the end. Uh, there we go. So, you can, if you're not in the UK, so it must be in America, um, you can watch The Abyss in 4K on Amazon, Voodoo, and movies everywhere for 20 bucks, but not in the UK. Uh, anyway, attractive AI generated model rakes in 11,000 a month. Unbelievable. <laughs> Oh dear. Right. Oh, I've done it again. Bloody hell. Pressing the wrong buttons. There we go. There, that's the end. That's the end of the news for today. Right. So, we'll leave it there. Right. So, thanks, Wind Grace, for helping me out uh, in this uh, news uh, um, uh, thing in my bob. And Josh Temple was there here early on, uh, but didn't say anything. <laughs> After introducing himself, he must be busy. He must be busy. Uh, Wingrace asks, going to sing a Stargate Christmas song again this year? No, I'm not. I don't have to because Jay from Sidetrack has done one, hasn't he? <laughs> I put a link in mine, uh, in the comments in mine. Uh, so he's, he's done one at Sidetrack. Because he wrote that the one that I sang last year, he was going to sing it. Um, and then he bottled it, so I thought, oh, sorry, I'll do it. <laughs> and, uh, but he's, do, he's written a new one, uh, and he sings that. Uh, better than me. But everybody sings better than me. I'm tone deaf. I remember when I was at school, they were doing, like, auditions for the school choir, and everybody had to have a go. You were, like, forced to do it. So teachers sitting there at the piano, and come on, Stephen, it's your turn. I didn't get very far. <laughs> I wasn't in the choir. Better or different? <laughs> uh, is he just typically still around? Glad I caught the end. Sorry, way too busy. That's fine. That's fine. That says don't drop everything just to listen to this silly, bloody YouTube idiot. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I forgot to switch my lights on, didn't I? Behind. Never mind. Never mind. Right, I'm going to go now and sort some uh, supper out for me and Aidan, because I'm hungry. So there. Right. So what's coming up next? Uh, we're on Wednesday. So Friday is uh, Friday Night Appointment with Fear. Uh, harpoon tick reference. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, is that actually in the tick? Is that you mean tick reference? Or you just, you mean like you've ticked a box? You got to shout harpoon when Josh is around. Don't know. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Uh, Friday night appointment with Fear this week is Sint, 
Um, actually, I can show you the uh, the intro. What we're going to see uh, this Friday. So I'll give you a clue as to what the film's like. You ready? Here we go. There we go. <laughs> so that's uh, that's what's coming this Friday. Uh, next Monday, as I said, I think I think it's Batman Begins next Monday. I think it is. Could be wrong. I better check, Anta. Let's have a look. Uh, now then, where have I put me uh, my little list? <laughs> my little list of stuff. Uh, yes, Batman Returns is uh, next Monday on Magnificent Mondays. Then next week's. Friday Night Appointment with Fear is Krampus from 2015. It's kind of become a Christmas classic, hasn't it? Almost overnight. And then on Christmas Day, uh, Magnificent Mondays, we're doing a Bond double bill, Spy Who Love Me and Moonraker. Um, and my uh, on the 29th of December, is uh, Friday Night Appointment with Fear is a Christmas horror story, a Canadian film. Uh, like an anthology of Christmas stories, horror stories, um, with William Shatner, uh, which is uh, cool. Uh, and then on New Year's Day, Magnificent Mondays, is The Time Machine from 1960, not the new version, the uh, 1961, because that's set on New Year's Day in 1900, isn't it? So that's what we're doing. So that's what's coming up over the next uh, few weeks. Um Krampus, Adam Scott is in that. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And um, um, Tony uh, Collette, one of my favourite actresses, Tony Collette is in it as well. Uh, uh, just a little bit for my album to drop. <laughs> I'm a long wait, mate. Uh, Spoon in the... Oh, right. So it is a Tick the TV series, right? I've seen it. That's the one with... Um, um, Peter Serafinovitz as the tick in it, is it? I think it is, isn't it? I have seen some of it. Uh, I've not seen all of it. Uh, since you didn't know him when I mentioned him from the Madame Web trail, or Madame Madame Web trail. Um, oh, is that Adam Scott? Oh, right. <laughs> right. Say, I wouldn't. I know he's in Krampus, <laughs> but uh, anyway, whatever. Right, so that's what's coming up. Right, we'll leave it there. I'm going now. So that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. As I always say, you make it a bazillion million times better uh, with your interactions uh, than just me talking here. Um, yes, there's been grace. There's an older one with Patrick Warburton, which is good too. Uh, an older Krampus, or I know, um, I don't know. Um, the only other Krampus film I know is uh, was it Krampus the Christmas Demon, which I've not seen. I've got it somewhere, but I've not I've not actually watched it. I keep forgetting about it. Uh, but that might not be what you're on about. Krampus does make an appearance in the Christmas horror story. Uh, anyway. Oh, and The Tick, sorry. <laughs> the two live-action TV shows and one anime. All right. I'm on about the one with Peter Sandefinovitz as The Tick. Peter Serafinovitz, who did the voice of Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace. Uh, that's the one I've seen with him. Uh, and it was quite funny. Right, I'm going. So, thanks for watching, wherever you are. Look after each other. And until next time, I'll see the... Uh, where have I put my thing? <laughs>